Hi, and welcome to Ethnographic Imagination Basel, a series on reimagining the world from the mundane. My name is George Paul Mayu, and in this episode, we will talk about materiality. What it means to engage with objects, substances, and textures in a deeper sense, and how this relates to the work of imagination. Our guest is um, Karine Ayele Durand, uh, whose curatorial and scholarly work has involved collaboration with indigenous peoples to rethink engagements with material culture, visual arts, and the museum. So stay tuned for a conversation on how materiality may open up new possibilities for the political imagination. Ayala Durand um, is director of the Museum of Ethnography in Geneva. She holds a doctorate in anthropology from the University of Cambridge and two masters, one in ethnology, the other in international negotiations from the University of Aix-en-Provence um, in France. Karine started her career as curator at what was then the Natural History Museum of Lyon, France, where she was in charge of the America collections. She then held various curatorial and research positions in the UK, Norway and Sweden. Her research revolves around material culture and visual arts, working with indigenous peoples in the Arctic, the Brazilian Amazon and Canada. Um, Karine is also author of essays such as Artistic Practice and Museum Ethnography, Indexing Inauthenticity, Art and Artifact in Ethnography Museums, and Redefining Curatorship, a Skilled Practice. Our conversation will revolve um, today on materiality and the growing recognition of its political nature. Karine, we are happy you accepted our invite and uh, very glad to have you um, in the studio with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Shall we start maybe with some of the basics? And I'm thinking materiality is not a concept that is too easily definable, at least not for everyone in a, outside a more anthropological community of specialists. And, but there is a lot of talk about it, uh, both in anthropology and in, in, in public debate. Um, can you help us understand this term? Um, and what is it to be gained from talking about materiality, as opposed to simply talking about objects and things? Yeah, that's a good question, because I think we ended up thinking and saying that I like when we talk about things, maybe rather than materiality. So materiality, it's true, it's, it's not an easy concept. And uh, importantly, for anthropologists, for social anthropologists, I'm a social anthropologist myself. And when I was studying at the university in Cambridge, I was the only one in the PhD group where I was uh, working with uh, studying materiality or material culture or heritage. And most of my uh, colleagues were working on, on social relationships, social networks, uh, diseases, medicine, thinking, and none of them was looking at what we can call materiality. And, and myself, I must say that I get to materiality in a kind of a long journey. It wasn't at such. I, as you said in the introduction, I, I was lucky enough to work in a museum uh, when I was 25 years old. And at that time, I was much more interested in what people could say about their life and their experience. And it took me a time to realize that we could all talk about this through things mm. and with objects, with artifacts. That's when I started to realize that materiality things, objects, artifacts, like this one, for example, was a fantastic way to not only talk about culture and identity, but actually it was about the real thing and what this thing was revealing when people were together with this thing. And for a long time, I would say that in literature, materiality was considered as an object and then people would put their emotions into this thing and then people will say like this thing is representing someone else something else um, and while working with objects working in museums i realized that when we take the thing seriously uh, something happens and i can tell you more about this I, I, <laughs> what I, happens I, maybe we can dwell on that something something happens because you're pointing to it seems to me 
a distinction between simply seeing a thing as a thing. In other words, it's closed. It's a closed entity that symbolizes something, but it's there and it's outside my thoughts, my affects, my senses um, and something else where you can engage with a thing that is perhaps open more porous exactly. uh, might we say it's exactly um, this yes it's exactly this it's like something more porous and then you start not thinking about the thing which is outside of you but you start thinking through the thing so mm -hmm. that's why i brought my favorite, one of my favorite books here which is called yeah. thinking through things that accompany me a lot It was written by by several scholars, and one of them uh, was my my PhD supervisor. And this is this: you just not talk about the thing from outside, but you start thinking through it and trying to see what this thing, where this thing is leading you. And that's something that might happen that you you mentioned emerges out of this different relationship uh, that we would posit to the thing. Yes, it's something I. And I was interested in during during my my PhD research, but I can see it also uh, in my practice as a museum curator. When you start um, being with the thing, and most of all, when you start looking at the way the thing is being done and made, this is when something kind of happens or reveals itself through the process of making it. So this is why I used um, a concept that I didn't invent myself, of course, but I use, which is skilled practice. Right. This is when you start getting the practice of looking at things in a certain way and you get to become skilled in the fact of looking at this thing and then looking at the way this thing is being made. And then things emerge like information about uh, indigeneity, for example, in the case I was studying. But it could also be transmission, uh, intergenerational practices, and um, human rights, and all these kind of things. It, you make me think also that, um, I mean, as little as I know about curatorial practices and, and museum inventories in the past, there wasn't a certain kind of engagement with the object as ready-made, a thing in itself that you measure, right? You, yeah, you right. describe its palette of colors and textures and some very kind of simple ways and you put it in an inventory what you talk about seems to be a different kind of um, engagement when you think through it and with it yeah. and through the practice of making it i wanted to come back to the skilled practice thing but before that we're talking also quite a bit today about objects and the materiality of things as agentive as mm -hmm. lively or alive um as spirited um in some context um Does that come closer to what you're describing here? Yeah, in a way, but it, of course we couldn't say that any object is, is alive or is, uh, is considered as a person. This reflection came from the relation I had with several indigenous peoples coming from different places in the world. And for some of them, for the Maori, for example, uh, in New Zealand, some objects that we call in our museum practice object are not considered as object, but are, are living things, ancestors. So, of course, when you start working in a museum setting, you consider that a glass, a book, or a toy is, is, is a thing which is just lying here. But when, of course, you start working with people who see this object not as uh, a thing, but as a person, you start thinking, like, maybe I shouldn't just perceive that this person is considering or thinking or believing it is a thing and the, the real question is what happens when i stop uh, having this distance between me and this person who says that this is my ancestor what happens when i start to see this as an ancestor too mm -hmm. and not only as they consider it is their ancestor or they believe it is an ancestor so this, this is why of course it changes our practice as museum practitioners to start thinking okay now Let's consider that this is not a thing, object, inert, but someone, a person. Then how does it change my way of cataloging it, putting it in inventory? How does it change my way of putting it on the shelf? Uh, how does it change my way to put it behind or not behind a display right. case? So it, it sounds that on the one hand, this kind of older 
a register in which we believe that the thing is a thing. It's an objective dead matter that just stands there. Also went hand in hand with another kind of objectification, the objectification of various kinds of modes of being in the world as beliefs. It's the beliefs of so-and-so in a way separating that from and, and maintaining a certain relationship between one as a scholar or as a uh, uh, curator and an object. But once you see the object as something to think through and people as collaborators, as you do, to think with, this whole relationship seems to change. Yes, I think I think so. Yes, I think it changes. Uh, not only with the thing, <laughs> but also among people. And we start creating what I called uh, an assemblage when people and things are getting together and then they raise their concerns and then what happened from this moment. So on that note, um, in your curatorial work, you have used the assemblage um, and you... You used it also to think about very concrete interactions. So one example that comes to mind, and um, if you want to share it with um, our um, audience, is that of handling a particular set of objects, two totem poles um, that you had, um, the museum um, in Geneva uh, had from Alaska. Um, and that the way in which you kind of try to conserve them and find a place for them prompted you to think about the assemblage. Am I right? Yes, uh, because of course it is, it's a long story, but these uh, totem poles arrived in Geneva in the 1950s, 1956, uh, to the museum to be exhibited, to be on display just in front of the museum. And uh, we had very little information about these totem poles, about the fact that they, we knew it was kind of a, a chance, the name of the sculpture, of the carver. And uh, we knew where they were, where they were, of course, uh, purchased from, from a city called Ketchikan in Alaska. But that was it. And um, we're very fortunate because the great granddaughter of the, the, the collector lives in Geneva and she's a, she's a, she's a filmmaker. And she was very much interested in, uh, in knowing the history of a, of a great grandfather, but also his travels. So she decided to go back on his traces. To, to see the place where he, he, he brought these totem poles from. And then she started to question people. Where are these totem poles? What, what realized, do you remember these totem poles? People in Alaska. In Alaska. And she was told that uh, the, the, the carver didn't come from this spe special city, but another one a bit further, <laughs> further up, which, we, which is called Metlakatla. So she went to Metlakatla. And then she, she met with a great, uh, I don't know what to mix up with, uh, with uh, a genealogy here, but this is a grand, um, this granddaughter of a grand niece of, of the, the of this carver. And so she, she got all this information about this, the carver, but also the very moment where this, when these totem poles were created, which was a moment quite important in this um, culture because of the ban. Well, there's this very important ban um, against the potlatch, which is the ceremonies and the language. So a full new history came through this encounter because we didn't know at all in Geneva that the carver had a family, still relatives, and then we didn't know at all about the history um, and the context, the historical context around it. And then she, she managed to get in touch with several carvers from, um, from Metakatla and we invited them over to come to Geneva to help us um, understand about the carving. And while working with them, it was very important to look at the materiality of the totem poles to realize that specific uh, Timshan, they are called Timshan, the people is Timshan people. Specific traits of Tim Timshan carving uh, was very much embedded within the wood, within the, within the totem poles. And the story carry on and goes on still since 2018 because we were lucky to know that one of the carvers we invited was the <laughs> was a master carver, and this master carver as an apprentice, the apprentice was the great grand nephew of the, 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 original the carver, carver, the original carver. So we've been working together since 2018, and um, this the descendant is coming to Geneva in May 2024. 
And we are having a small part of our next temporary exhibition with this carver. And we keep on thinking about what's going to happen to the totem poles. So on the one hand, there, it seems that the totem poles were like thresholds or like some sort of a, a, a gate into a whole universe of historical um, relations, um, uh, ancestors and descendants, um, um, both of the carver and the person who acquired it. What are you referring to here as the assemblage, the object as, or the materiality of the object as assemblage? This assemblage to me is not only the materiality of it, it's not only the totem poles as material and our self, our bodies as material, but it's also um, the history, it's also the, con the context, historical context being assembled around us with this. Uh, the ancestors, the carver himself, even though he's been dead for a long time, and uh, and also as part of this assemblage, this may be the future of these two temples. Um, are they going to stay in Geneva? Right. Are they going maybe one day, we don't know, uh, back to Metlakatla? The assemblage is the way of putting together several things. So that's why I come back to things, uh, not objects, but several things together to talk about the past, to talk about the present, all kind of question about indigeneity, for example, of contemporary indigeneity and indigenous rights are putting up, are being raised as, as well in the conversation, but also maybe the future. So everything is kind of related and assembled in a, in a room. So, uh, so things, but also actors and technologies. You had a filmmaker, you had photographers involved in this project, um, and they open up this place of thinking. Um, so in a way, assemblage can also inform the political decisions museums make on the long run about, um, about particular yes. things. Yeah, definitely. Because of course, what we do is always political. Right. <laughs> we realize it, and we realize it through this assemblage. Definitely, yes. I'm going to just go back a little bit to skilled practice, a term that you refer or, or you use um, to, um, to push against this idea of a passive object. Um, this is just there to be looked at, um, uh, contemplated, um, and offers more of the alternative that you mentioned, that of thinking through things. Um, how did you come to this um, um, realization? How did you come to um, thinking that it is important to also craft, to be part of the craft of making um, making objects? They came from two different places. One is like practice, my own practice, and the other one is through a book, an anthropologist. My practice was as part of my research. I was working with an artist um, from um, New Zealand, some, someone of uh, um, descent, but living in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, Rosanna Raymond. And I was part of a, a project of creating a huge display case for the introduction of exhibition, which was called Pacifica Styles, that was held in the University Museum of, of Cambridge in 2005 and six. And Rosanna was in charge of creating this, um, what she called a display case was called Island. Welcome to the club, an island with E, E Y E, Island. And I actually took many, many weeks <laughs> with her within the display case, creating the display case, accompanying her while she was uh, putting together all these things. And she was, um, she asked me at, at some point to help her um, do a, what she called a hula skirt, which is a, call, a skirt mm -hmm. made with raffia. But while she was making the skirt and I was helping her making the skirt, I realized that the way we would do it, we're using our fingers and using a um, and touching the, the fiber, we would also kind of weave a, a memories, a history, a life, and everything was woven together through this uh, in this work. And at some point, when you look at the way she was making the display case, we could see, I could see it, at least myself, that she was assembling so many things again. The history of, of the Maori, movement from the 1960s and 70s and up to the 1980s and 90s. The question of what is what it is to, to be an authentic uh, Maori artist or not. So she was questioning indigeneity, authenticity, and th she would do it through the making. And I was taking part of this. And at the same time, I was reading a book uh, about an anthropologist called David Gus, who um, had spent some time in Guyana 
and in Brazil. And he was desperate. I mean, in this book he writes, uh, during his research, he was desperate about finding a way to uh, hear and know about mythology. And he couldn't get anyone to talk to him about mythology. He was like, can you tell me about your history? Can you tell me about your 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 the story of your, of your people from through the different myths? And people would say, I don't know what you're talking about, in a way. And at some point, he, he decided that he had no, no things to do. So he said, I'm going to hang about with, with the, the pottery makers and I'm going to stay with them for a while. And why being there with the pottery makers and making pots, you could realize that listening to them, that they were actually making mythology at the same time. So the way you just put the meaning and the history within the thing you're actually making, that was kind of an eye opener for me. And I started to, to hang around <laughs> many artists and, and artisans and craft people and being with them. And I also accompanied a, a Sami artist, a Sami drum maker during nine months, uh, created a drum for the Anthropology Museum of Cambridge. And while I was with him working on this drum, we would talk about, again, so many things about history, about political questions, about indigeneity. And not only talking about, but actually was making it just right in front of me. From my, from, I could see with my eyes that he was making all these things, using the, the skin of the drum, painting the drum, the way he painted it, the way he used the fabric to, to create it, the way he, he would sew the, the old drum. Everything was put together. So, of course, when you get to a museum and then you see things behind the display case, you just lose the, the relationship with all the things that came, all the words that were given and, and transmitted while people were making things. But when you're here and you can follow it, the process, you realize that these things are so thick and not only uh, an object, passive, as you said at the beginning, but they're actually so talkative. And, and is there a way to, to transmute, transmutate that sort of doing into the um, to shake up the display case in a way for the museum mm -hmm. to avoid this kind of separation the reproduction of the object as a passive thing that's outside that requires contemplation yeah so in museum it's, it's very difficult and we're still thinking about how to do it <laughs> and uh, of course the the most obvious way is to have people talk about again is people talk about the object and I think it's one of the way we we do it, but we could invent so many other things, I suppose, to to just make the objects reveal it by itself. But it's kind of difficult to it's do it. I can imagine it yeah. is difficult. Yeah. Um, but just on that note, you you posit that the the skilled practice brings the, a subjective relation to the object in in view. Or I'm I'm struggling to articulate this. I think it is we make ourselves at the same time that we make mm. objects. And those, those things are not so neatly separated as we might otherwise think. Um, and in that sense, um, the, the practice of doing is a practice of self-making and probably also community making in, in many ways. But I wonder though, if that was not also the case in an older kind of register of museum work, um, where seeing the object as a thing separate from myself, is not also a way of self-doing. It's probably one that is not critically interrogating that sort of subjective self make I'm a subject, a rational subject, outside this object, right? But what, you, what you're proposing is questioning, it seems, that separation. Yes, it is. It is questioning that separation, even though because the more we assemble around things and with things, uh, the more we realize we actually, yes, questioning ourselves and questioning our community or sense of community and questioning the way we are making community and maybe questioning the way the past has been making us and the way we're going to shape the future as well. Everything is together. And on that note, and this is something where that we might have already discussed, but just because we live in a context in which museums of anthropology and ethnography find themselves having to account for extensive dispossession in all kind of all kinds of objects in co former colonial settings um i'm trying to think again at materiality and what materiality might do for our imagination an imagination that as you said is always political what we do is political um 
in order to help us think this relationship between things, museums, uh, modernity, coloniality, indigeneity, as in the case of your work, where do you see um, that this kind of imaginative work of materiality might come in in this broader, difficult context? Yes, it's a, it's a difficult question too. Um, because of course, depending on the scale we want to talk about, I mean, in the museums, we are delve into materiality all the time, but the difficulty is maybe that materiality is not only about objects. <laughs> so, so this is a tricky thing. Um, because when you start thinking through things, you realize that it's not only about solid things. It could be, um, it could be about, as I said earlier, it could be about uh, a text, a human rights document, for example, or, or even just the right of things could be material as, as well. So through materiality, you, you, you just put together all these things, as you said, coloniality, indigeneity, everything is, 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 um, is organized. And in museums, we, do it, we use it all the time. So I don't know whether the question is related to the museum practice in itself, or if it goes much broader uh, in the terms of what all the anthropologists may, may look at. So can you just yeah, and I think I, I, I was struggling to articulate that question, I admit. Um, and I think probably those two things are not um, unrelated because it is a question about how do we imagine, how do we come up with solutions? How do we imagine a future starting from the um, conundrums of, of the present? The museum as an institution, but also the, the museum in relationship with indigenous people, um, with people with whom it has been entangled in all kinds of asymmetric relations. On the other hand, Throughout this episode, you've been po pointing to practices that might otherwise seem trivial or inconsequential and showed how they are crucially, in a way, political in helping us reimagine. So maybe the scale can be broken itself somehow. I'm, I'm yeah, I think that's, that's one of the, um, of the practice we've been having. It. It's like, how can we, and we do it in the museum, for example, we just convene the skills. We work with weavers, for example, basket weavers, and we really ask the the, um, the audience, the visitors, whether they want to, to work with us and practice with us. Because the way we practice together, that's what you said, the way we practice, we start looking differently at the material culture, at the fibers, and we start talking about just um, all these things, environmental issues, environmental challenges, environmental injustice, social injustice. And the more we, we, we bring skills and skilled practice, the more we realize that uh, we are part of a huge fabric ourselves, as, as you know, as, as, as human, we've known humans. So this is when we start, make, as you said earlier, we start being part of this assemblage ourselves, individually, but also in a way of community practice. Definitely, yes. Karin. Uh, we are regrettably already out of time, but I want to thank you very much for the time and insightful conversation. And we look forward to um, discussing some of your very inspiring work in the future as well. And in the meantime, for um, our audience, I hope um, you get a chance to visit the Museum of Ethnography in Geneva and see um, uh, some of Karine's work. Thank you.